Good to be here. Amen. Let's pray. Father, Lord, this is your book. It's not man's book. It's yours. Lord, give us wisdom. Our Father, our people are being destroyed for lack of knowledge. They're asleep. God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you've turned the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter number 2 this morning, we're going to pick this up. I don't like uh, people who are alarmist just for the sake of being an alarmist. In other words, what they're doing is just simply they're sensationalizing something to get uh, exposure and what have you. You see a lot of that and have seen a lot of it. Make exorbitant uh, claims. Uh, I don't like that. You don't like that. No one that thinks likes that. But the fact of the matter is now we're living in a time when you need to be alarmed because some heavy-duty stuff's about to break on the scene. It already has, uh, but uh, more's coming. Make no mistake about that. More's coming. If you'll notice, the reason I chose this text in Second Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse 1 is because of uh, the profound implications. Look at verse 1. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. All right. Now that is coming to catch up his bride. Amen. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, is that the day of the Lord is at hand. Did I mess up? If your Bible says day of the Lord right here, throw it away and get yourself a real Bible. The day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, now watch this carefully. That day, the day of Christ, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Has that happened? There's no question about that. And that man of sin be revealed. Who's that? That's the Antichrist. He's called the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God. That's a Jewish temple. The church is not a temple. The Jewish temple showing himself that he, the church is the temple, but the church building is not a temple. Okay, that's, that's the difference. Sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. There's a time element involved in this, and it's very important to understand this. For the mystery of iniquity was already working 2,000 years ago, doth already work. Only he who now letteth, that is the old English use of the word let, would you let me do something? That's how it's you. See, will you allow me? You're hindering me. You're holding me back. Will you give me your permission? Will you let me do something? See how the word is used? So this is what it means here. Only he who now letteth or holdeth back will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy the brightness of his coming. Now, uh, a lot of people have wondered why is it since the new world order is working so hard to bring about a one world government that they haven't succeeded. That's the reason. That's the reason. Right there. So therefore the call is not theirs, the call is God's. When God removes this letting, this hindering, this holding back power, now that in itself is another study altogether, but that's not the issue. The issue is God is the one restraining uh, the unleashing of uh, satanic power. But you're seeing it as it is being released piecemeal. You live in a satanic age. You live in a time when kids are, have, have been, when, in a time when the occult sciences and uh, the wildest stuff like vampires and werewolves and all this stuff have been glamorized. And they've been presented in a romantic fashion. When I was a kid growing up watching Lon Chaney and the rest of them playing werewolves and Frankenstein and all, scared us to death. There, was, there, was, there wasn't any glamour associated with it or romance, vampires, but not anymore. So what have they done? They've completely changed it. All right. Now, the Da Vinci Code, uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. Uh, first was a book, and now it's been made into a movie. Uh, Dan Brown has enriched himself greatly 
at the expense of the truth of the gospel. Because the premise of the Da Vinci Code is that the uh, Da Vinci Code itself, referring specifically to what uh, Leonardo da Vinci did when he, when he made the Last Supper, was to portray John as a woman, giving out a coded message to those who knew that this was Mary Magdalene uh, sitting at the table at the right hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the idea. It was like uh, Nostradamus. How many of you have ever heard of him? And his quatrains, which were intentionally, uh, intentionally uh, coded in such a manner where he couldn't be uh, found guilty and burned at the stake by the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I put no stock in Nostradamus, but I use that simply as an illustration that something can be coded. So uh, the Da Vinci Code is the idea that uh, there has been this secret knowledge that's passed from generation to generation and that in order to do it, they must remain underground and give forth the information in a coded message or cryptic form or something like that. And that's what that's about. But, but uh, the, whole, the bottom line of the whole thing is that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, allegedly had, uh, had, did not die at the cross and had a relationship with Mary Magdalene. They had children. These children uh, became the very elite of France and therefore a, a, a royal bloodline ensued from them. And uh, they can trace, uh, trace that back to the Moravingian family. And if you do a, a wiki search or anything on the internet, you'll find volume after volume after volume that refers to that. But here's what I'm going to call your attention to, and that's the idea that a certain group of people on this earth do feel like that they have the right to rule over you. It makes no difference whether it's a monarchy, a republic, a demo uh, democracy, or a, 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 a outright dictatorship, or whatever. They feel like they have been given that right. And we call them the global elite. Now, there's a lot of information available about this, and I'm going to take you back uh, to Margaret Sanger, but first I want to make a quote by Kevin Trudeau. This man is a billionaire, and uh, this information is all over the web, and here's what he's supposed to have said. He stated that elitist he had talked to through their plans were for the greater good of humanity. They know what's better, best for you. But that they believe there were two classes of people on earth, two classes, only two, the ruling elite and the worker bees. See, I'm one of the bees. <laughs> of course, everybody doesn't work. <laughs> anyway, and that the elite were defined, now watch carefully, listen carefully. The elite were not defined necessarily by money or power but by their genetic ancestry. Now we get into race, we get into the root race, we get into the issue. Their genetic ancestry, in plain words, they inherited this. Now what does it say in the Gospel of John, chapter number one, which were born not of what? Uh -huh. Which were born, and but there's another st statement there, which were born not of what? Blood, or the will of men. Blood means by their ancestry. That's what it meant. In plainer words, the, the gospel of Christ and the offer of the new birth is to anyone regardless of where they came from. So therefore, we get into the idea of the elitist who feel like that they have been given this mandate because of their birth. Now you say, well now, don't you think that's kind of wild? No, not when you see what's, being go what's going on behind your back right now and what's happening to bring about a new world order and to put the Antichrist in power and the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven would be would be would be woefully uh, would be woefully uh, missing a, a mark a point if I did not cover this and that is that we are near that point where they are going to put their man forth and when they put him forth they're going to put him to the test if he passes the test he will be their man I don't know if you've noticed or not but Barack Obama is beginning to fall from grace. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. But anyway, how many of you have ever heard of Margaret Sanger? All right. How many of you have ever heard of Planned Parenthood? Uh, when uh, they take up the, uh, don't they take up a, 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 a collection every year at your workplace for the United Way? Yes, they do. Is Planned Parenthood, uh, are they supported from, through the United Way? Okay, so bottom line is that you are pressured into giving to this each year from your workplace. It makes no difference whether you like who it's going to or not. That's the way things are done. 
You've got one thing on paper, the way things are, the high ideals of something, but then on the other hand, you've got the way it's done. That's life, the way it works, okay? Constitution says one thing, but this is the way we do it. See, that's, that's, that's the way it points. That's, <laughs> okay. Uh, Margaret Sanger, in her own words, just a few of the uh, quotes of this woman. By the way, she's the one who started Planned Parenthood. She's the founder of Planned Parenthood. Here's what she said on black people immigrants and indigents, quote, human weeds, reckless breeders, spawning human beings who never should have been born, uh, on sterilization and racial, racial purification. Sanger believed that for the purpose of racial purification, couples should be rewarded who chose sterilization. On the right of married couples to bear children, couples should be required to submit applications to have a child, she wrote in her plan for peace. Did I not just read something a few days ago about this almighty federal government that wants to take your children away from you if they're obese? And the obesity, of course, is connected with what? Health. All right, which goes right back to the United Nations, the World Health Organization. See the connection? Whoever gave the almighty federal government that kind of control? You didn't give it to them. Did you know that? Fact is, you didn't tell them it was okay to create the Federal Reserve System in 1913. You didn't tell them that. Nobody ever voted on that. Did you know that? Do you realize all the stuff they do and nobody ever votes on it? Anyway, on the purpose of birth control, the purpose in promoting birth control was to create a race of thoroughbreds. Now hold it just a minute. You say, well, well, preacher, Margaret Sanger lived back in the early 1900s. Yeah, but Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg didn't. How many of you know her? Never met the lady, don't have anything <laughs> against her personally. But I make sure that this is a correct quotation because of the implications. All right, listen carefully. Most of the time, this sick obsession with population control does not make headlines, but a couple of recent events has brought these issues to the forefront once again. The first involved Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Quote, Frankly, I thought that at the time Roe was decided, there was concern about population growth, and particularly growth in populations that we don't want to have too many of. Now just think on that for a while. This is a Supreme Court Justice. All right. Now, Mr. Obama has a top science advisor. His name is John P. Holden. And he's quite a writer. And in his work, he talks about a, uh, well, let's just read the paragraph. For example, John Holden, Barack Obama's top science advisor, co-authored a book, 1977, in which he advocated mass sterilization using the food and water supply, mandatory bodily implants that would prevent couples from having children, forced abortions for American couples, try to have too many children, a global police force to enforce population control. Man! What, you, what I'm trying to say to you right now is that they are creating the structure they're creating the structure of a totalitarian one world government. And if you don't take their mark, and the truth of the matter is, they'll choose whether you take the mark or not, not you. <laughs> Never heard it put that way, have you? They'll decide whether you live or die. If they decide that you're worth keeping, they'll give you a mark. If you're one of the useless eaters, as Margaret Sanger called them, human weeds, Reckless breeders spawning human beings who never should have been born. That's a mighty big statement, isn't it? Amen. That's playing God. See what I mean? And any time a man or woman begins to play God, they're way out of their league. I don't care if they got an IQ of 170. I don't care if the smartest man on the face of the earth. They're out of their league. Way out of their league way out. Now, a fellow by the name of Michael Treese, get into the, the idea of population control. Are these people serious about controlling the population of the world? Do they really think that they can control it? 
It says in the book of Revelation, chapter number 13, no man might buy or sell unless you have the mark of the beast, the name of the beast, or the number of his name. That's some heavy-duty stuff. Well, one way that you could control the population of the world is through man-made plagues. Nobody knows where AIDS came from. But there's some people who are pretty sure they know. This man says in 1992 he walked in the University of North, Carolina, North Dakota Laboratory to do some research on congressional documents. He said the documents Department of Defense Appropriations for 1970, House Bill 15090. The main issue of this document was, and I quote, within the next five to ten years it would probably be possible to make a new infective microorganism which could differ in certain important aspects from any known disease-causing organisms. Most important of these is that it might be refractory to the immunological and therapeutic processes upon which we depend to maintain our relative freedom from infectious disease. That's just a big long way of saying that they've created a monster that they can't control. And when it's unleashed, it's unleashed. It's called AIDS. Uh, did they do that? Did, uh, did somebody in the laboratory create AIDS? If somebody in the laboratory created AIDS, then there must be a much higher authority behind the person that created AIDS. Well, this is a fact right here. This is from Carl Steinberger, 1976. The following ad appeared in New York newspapers. Last chance for gay men to join the hepatitis B vaccine program. A sexually transmitted disease enrollment closes in June, after which the vaccine may not be available for several years. Take the free blood test to determine your hepatitis B status and eligibility for the program. A thousand over a thousand gay men took the free vaccine to time when there was no such disease as AIDS. This is 1976. Then, by 1978, the infection began popping up all over the gay community. Strangely enough, it was predominant among the volunteers who had taken the free hepatitis B vaccine. Within five years, 60% of these men were infected with HIV. Well, then you're saying that they have created a, a laboratory infectious disease for the purpose of wiping out certain segments of the population and other groups of people. Now, let's just think of the implications. If that's true, you are dealing with a monster, right? You are. You are dealing with people who would wipe you from the face of the earth and not blink. That's a monster. They don't care. They play God. They're playing God. But the bottom line is that you hear a lot of people who believe that we have too many people. All right. That doesn't mean that they want to kill you. You have to look at it in the right perspective. There's a lot of people that believe the population of the earth is too big. We need to, that, uh, we need to do something about, population, about birth control. That's the way they approach it. In other words, let's take care of the ones that are going to be born. So how do you do it? Well, there's a number of ways. The, the most convenient way is through abortion. And 50 million babies have fallen, uh, fallen victim to abortion. 50 million, 50 million babies have fallen victim to abortion. 50 million little faces, 50 million little hearts beating, 50 million little people, 50 million people have fallen victim to abortion. I want you to go around every once in a while and just think on that number for a while. That's an overwhelming thing. 50 million have died as a, as a result of abortion. If you're going to control the population, how will you do it? Well, disease is one way. Abortion is another way. A war is another way. Wars do definitely get rid of a lot of people. Here's the sad thing about wars. Here's the sad thing about wars. The, big, the best and the finest are the ones who die. It's the ones with courage and, and the cream. Of, they're the ones who go to the battlefield and die. Not, not the draft dodgers like Mr. Clinton that they made president rewarded for draft dodging. No, no, no. It's the young men who come back with their arms blown off and their legs blown off and quadriplegics and, 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 and for the rest of their lives they, they, have, to, uh, you know, they have to live a, a very uh, a limited life. Uh, it's the brave ones who go off to war. And the elitists, the global elitists, for some, you know, somehow or another, they're able to keep their kids out of war. Have you ever noticed how that 
When's the last time you heard of, uh, of some of the big names that you hear about all the time of any of their sons being shot to death over here in Iran or Iraq, Iraq or Afghanistan? You ever thought about that? You ever thought about that? There must be that uh, way that they can pull some strings or they know somebody or what have you. You know, and uh, yeah, it's the young men and women who go off to war. And wars have been planned. Do you think that's right? Albert Pike, 1809-1891, said that there will be a three world wars. He said the third world war is in preparation for their establishment of their world government. Now, there's a lot of controversy about whether Pike said this or not. And uh, you can get on the internet and do and do and do your research if you want to. He designed, it says, a plan for world conquest and wrote it in a letter to Mazzini dated August 15, 1871. He said three future world wars would prepare the world for the new world order. Now that's a big statement. <laughs> I mean, it shows you too how far back they go in their preparation for bringing about what they intend to do. Now, here is something that I firmly believe. There's no doubt in my mind about it, and it'd be proven. There is an elitist group of people who definitely believe that regardless of the form and structure of your government and your country makes no difference to these people, and they are not tied to one country, they are everywhere, and they believe that they have been given the birthright, whatever, to rule over men. How many of you believe that? I have no problem believing that whatsoever. I have no problem. I have no problem believing that. I believe that. Now, the methods that they use might be brought into question. Whether they will go so far as to create a, 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 a virus or an infectious disease or something to wipe whole groups of people off the face of the earth. That makes them mass murderers, right? There's not a lot of controversy around 9-11 about how much involvement was, uh, how much involvement did the federal government have in that? Or, for example, uh, in the Oklahoma City bombing out there, there's an awful lot of uh, loose ends, things that aren't tied together, suspicions, uh, accusations, and things that just don't make sense. Uh, and there's an awful lot of people out there that believe there's a conspiracy afoot. They believe the reason for that is because they want to get laws passed in this country that will make it easier to control the people and bring them into subjection to a one world government. There's an awful lot of uh, people out there that believe, and there is a, a good bit of information, a good bit of documentation, uh, that the educational system in this country has been dumbed down to the point to where the average American is easily controlled. Amen. Easily controlled. They want to take your sovereignty away from you and they want to make you a citizen of the world. And a long time ago they figured the way to do that was to dumb you down. So, and just give you what to, you know, how, how must it take to keep a cow happy? When's the last time you saw a cow beating on the gate and said, let me out of here. I'm bored to death with this field. Well, he's, it doesn't take much to satisfy him. Why? Because he doesn't know much. I don't know how smart a cow is, but, you know, a, it, 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 he's, he's pretty dumb, okay? Truth of the matter, in some things he's smarter than we are, though. But, but, but you know, I'm using that as an illustration. Uh, if you keep them occupied and entertained and TV sets now, my goodness, friend, it'd blow your mind at how big they are and how cheap they are. And the sporting events and all of the stuff to keep you busy, keep your mind, keep you occupied. And, 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 and the only thing you know is what you're spoon fed. Very few people have any idea what it is to research anything, to know anything about going, what's going on. And so you come along with something that dazzles the mind because that's what you've been conditioned. When I say you, I'm talking about in general, not necessarily you particularly. Don't get offended with what I'm saying. I'm speaking in general terms that if it dazzles the mind, you know, it's, 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 it's the pop culture of the time, it, then, then, then you're part of it. And that's your world. And so when an antichrist rises up by the power of the elite and begins to take control of what he's already controlling, it won't be that big a change for you. See what I mean? How many of you believe that we're coming to that point? Yes, sir. That the controls are in place. Surveillance? Well, like you wouldn't believe. They're watching every move you make. They can easily watch what you do. 
tap into your phone, your internet, whatever. And so they know what's going on. Well, Albert Pike said there'd be three world wars. He said World War III is to be fomented by using the differences of the Illuminati to stir up between political Zionists, leaders of the Muslim world. Now, I want you to think about it for a minute. Even to think of this back in the 1800s of a political Zionist. Do you know what a political Zionist is? I mean, this is a smart man. Do you know what Zionism is? Let me explain something. Most of you know, but some of you don't know what Zionism is. You say, well, I thought that was Jewish. Well, here's the thing. Most Jews are in Zionism, but Zionism is a political movement to reestablish the Jewish homeland. See, all of that back Theodore Herzl, men like that back in the 1800s, to reestablish a Jewish homeland. You see, back in the 1800s, Israel did not exist as you understand it today. That's Zionism. Now, there's a lot of Jews, it's my understanding, especially the ultra-Orthodox Jews who are anti-Zionist, completely against it. So you can't say that all Jews are Zionist. And you can't say all Zionists are Jews, because there's some Gentiles in it too. So Zionism is a political movement to reestablish a Jewish homeland. Did they do it? May 14, 1948, when David Ben-Gurion stood up and announced Israel as a sovereign nation, the first country to recognize Israel as a sovereign nation will blow your mind. <laughs> It'll blow your mind. Do you know who it was? It was Russia. It was Russia. And then uh, our president, Mr. Truman, uh, was, uh, was quick to come in, and the United States supported them. And that's all it took, just like you saw in the last couple of days that they are recognizing the rebels in, uh, in Libya. No, is it Libya or Egypt? Libya as a, as a, as a, as, as a gen gen genuine bona fide government. Who do you mean recognize? See what I mean? How governments come into existence, they recognize them. So he says there'll be three world wars. He said, after the third world wars ended, those who aspired undisputed world domination provoked the greatest social cataclysm the world has ever known. We shall unleash the nihilists, so forth and so on, provoke a formidable social cataclysm, which in all its horror will show clearly to the nations the effect of absolute atheism, origin of savagery, and of the most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere, the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries will exterminate the destroyers of civilization. The multitude disillusioned with Christianity, whose deistic spirits will be from that moment without compass, direction, anxious for an ideal, but without knowing where to render to adoration, will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer brought finally out in the public view. A manifestation which will result from the general reactionary movement which will follow the destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. What about that? I don't have a use for Christianity, but I love the Lord Jesus Christ. Christianity, as you understand it today, is a man-made religion with no power, authority. This is what he assaults. This is what the atheist assaults. This is what the agnostic assaults. This is what a historian assaults. This is this, this Christianity, this Christian religion with all of its blood on its hands for 2,000 years. That's what they assault. They can't assault the Lord Jesus Christ. They have to say, as Pontius Pilate did, I find no fault in him. Amen. Now let's ask ourselves a question. It's either one or the other. Either Albert Pike said that or he didn't. Now I've read enough of his writings to know that I know he said or would have said or did say that Lucifer was the true God. There's no question about that. As to whether he said that there would be three world wars, that's in, that's in question. You know, you can't, uh, it's one of these things apparently you can't prove one way or another unless you could prove you had a document that Albert Pike created back in the 1800s, in 1871. You'd have to be able to do that. But I have no problem believing that there is a conspiracy. All right, now look here, folks. We're in 2011, and we're close to 2012. And we've come a long way since 1871. 1871 wasn't that long after the uh, war between the states. So uh, here we are in 2011. 
And there's an awful lot of things coming up in 2012, and that's something I'll talk to you about on, on a later date. Uh, we're, on the, we're on the verge of something, something that's going to happen. Now, it's an amazing thing to me, it really is, how that race has become an issue. In, in the book of, in the book of uh, uh, John, which were born not of blood, all right? That means of race or of, or, or of, or, or of, of um, uh, what? Genealogy. That's it. That's the word. Genealogy, succession, begetting. And so there in John chapter number one, the Lord said, you're not born into this. And it's not, you know, this is not just for a certain elite or elected few. That's the idea. Said uh, in John chapter number one, which were, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the man, nor the flesh, but of God. So the Bible makes it clear that salvation is offered to all men. Amen. And when it comes to the matter of salvation, salvation, God is irrespective of persons. Amen. He's no respecter of persons. Time and again, he says that. Now, God can elect and God can choose. And that's God's business if he chooses to do that. But that does not mean because he has elected that he has excluded. Amen. See, that's the problem. When God chooses to elect, he elects. The Apostle Paul says, He chose me and separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace. Is that election? Yes, sir. Absolutely. He was a chosen vessel, Paul said to Ananias. He said, He is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name to the Gentiles. Ananias said, even so, didn't argue with him. So it is. We are dealing with people here who are as demon-possessed as somebody can be. So how do you know that? Well, I know that because of what he says in Daniel. When he says that they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Now you see, this is the part of the Christian religion or so-called Christianity. Church I was saved into, they would know the difference between a demon and a crazy man. They didn't believe it. And they're good people. But it didn't take me long. It didn't take me long studying the Bible to find out that the Lord Jesus Christ confronted evil spirits time, time, and time again, and they were not in everybody he dealt with. Amen. There's not a word in there about, about Nicodemus being, being demon-possessed. But it showed up over and over and over again. That's something you've got to deal with. It's such a shame that, uh, that 13, 20, however many millions there are, these Southern Baptist people, a lot of good Southern Baptist people, but so many of them, they're pastors. I don't know if you know this or not, but the Southern Baptist Convention is one of the strongest supporters of the Masons in the world. You know, what I just said to you is, is, is the kind of thing that people just get mad about and stomp off. But they had, I, one of, some of their schools, the top men are top Masons. Many of their pastors are Masons. And we're talking about Albert Pike, who is a grand totem pole, <laughs> 30, whatever he is, potentate, big dog. <laughs> and he, he's the top man. And they're talking about a conspiracy to bring about a one world government. Yes, sir. It's true, it is, brother, it is. And that's what, that, give, that causes them a great deal of problems. <laughs> he said the Southern Baptist official position is amillennial. Although my pastor was premillennial, Southern Baptist, still he was a minority, I'm sure, in the convention. And amillennial means no millennium. That's what the term means. Basically, three basic categories, but they're not that simple to break down, but they are premillennial, amillennial, and postmillennial. But there's a lot of variations in all of it. That's three simple basic categories. I'm premillennial, but I'm also pre-trib rapture. Mm -hmm. And there's some premillennial who are not pre-trib rapture. They believe in a mid-trib rapture. They believe in a post-trib rapture. But, you know, that's a different study altogether. So the problem is, though, that when you have this kind of infiltration into Christianity or into the Christian religion, what have you got? What have you got? Do you think I could get up and teach this in the average Southern Baptist church? All right. If I can't go into that church and teach this, who is going to go into that church and teach that? Nobody. Well, therefore, if no one is ever going to go into that church and teach that, then those people, if they don't 
take the initiative and go out and learn it on their own and study it on their own, how are they going to remain? Amen. Ignorant. And that's exactly where Satan wants to keep you. Ignorant. Yes, sir. And ignorance is expensive. Yes, sir. It's very expensive. That's why you pay that medical doctor big bucks. You don't pay him. How many of you have ever gone to a medical doctor and he worked you over and did this to you and did that to you and did this to you and did that? No, what he did was stand there with his little, his little, his little uh, clipboard and he wrote down some few things and looked at your record and says, well, I'm going to give you this and that and blah, 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 and gave you a prescription. Now, not always, but usually, and all he did was write down a prescription. You took it to the pharmacist and they filled your prescription. And that's what that medical doctor did for you. It was what he knew right here. That's what you're paying him for. You're paying him for what he knows, all right? And so ignorance is very expensive. Now, what you're getting in here is you're getting a double train load and probably the point of choking on it of information because I'm giving out so much stuff in here that sometimes you get lost in the shuffle. And I'm afraid of that. I'm afraid I'm, I'm, afraid I'm liable to do that. I've given you a lot of information in the last few weeks a lot. If somebody, if you went into the average, well, let's say 10 years ago, not today, because today they're in it. But if you went into the average Christian religion church today and asked them, uh, how many of them ever heard of Kundalini Yoga? 10 years ago, if you went into that church, you, you might get one hand out of 500. They don't know anything about that. But today, 10 years later, a church over here in, that I know of in Clinton, because I saw their website and they advertise it, is into yoga. You say, well, it's not kundalini yoga. It's yoga. And for your own edification, take the time to type the word yoga into the Internet. And please, please, don't waste your time with some brainwashed American has to say about it. Go get you a Hindu Go get you a Hindu where yoga came from and let that Hindu tell you what yoga is and then let him show you all the disciplines of yoga. Kundalini is one of them, but there's probably 20 more disciplines of yoga. Yoga itself is a door that opens you into this world. It's a, the word itself means yoke. You're literally bringing on you the authority of the, of the spirit world that you're entering, but yoga is a door. That's all it is. It's a door. You put yourself in a, in a passive state. Your mind goes into a passive state. And God gave you something when he made you to protect you. And what's that? That's an active state. In plain words, you can consciously reject something. But anytime you go into a passive state, you have opened the door. It can come in. When you are watching television or in some other things, you are in most of the time a passive state. You're receiving everything that's being pumped into you. That's what yoga is. Yoga means that you have gone into a passive state. Oh, you think you are active, but you're not because you're yielding yourself to spirits. You are asking for their, you're asking for their, you're, you're, with your mind, you're approaching them, you're entering into it. And there's seven, seven chakras in the human body. Seven chakras in the human body and when the theosophist, theosophist movement started in the early 1900s in this country from Helen Blavatsky a Russian they talked about the seven stages of spiritual evolution of men where'd they get that from you suppose there's a connection well of course there is the evolutionary spiritual evolution of men how many of you have heard of Atlantis You've heard of Atlantis. Plato talked about Atlantis. Plato, Plato, in the, in the age of the golden age of Greek philosophy, two, three hundred years before Christ. Atlantis. What was Atlantis? Atlantis was one of those stages of spiritual evolution. Now, if you have been brainwashed by the average educational institution in this country, you believe in evolution. Right? Of course you do. That's the foundation, see? That's the foundation for what you, you compare everything to evolution, all right? But evolution itself, it, it, 
when you, when you begin to talk about evolution, you do have to look at it in a different perspective of simply biological evolution. Evolution has become this huge system where everything is explained by evolution, which includes social evolution, which includes spiritual evolution. And that's where you are. You see, the world is on the verge of evolving into its next higher plane. And that's where the Antichrist comes in. That's his message. He will feed the masses the message they need to hear, that they've been conditioned to hear, they've been pre-programmed to hear, and that is that you're ready now to get higher. I've noticed something about most, not all, but most of the occult religions, most of them, never mention the word sin. Never mention. It's not part of it. It's not part of the vocabulary. It has nothing to do with their relationship with a creator, redeemer salvation, blood atonement, all that. This is all unique to our faith. Think on that for a minute. All these occult religions are always talking about enlightenment, how you can be pulled higher, how you can evolve into this higher state of consciousness and become greater and greater and greater. It make a difference how you live, what kind of life you're living. It's all about empowering you to want to reach up to the next higher state are you following me here now? That's the kind of preaching you hear from the pulpits today. Oh, exactly. Okay. Seven. Seven successive stages to reach this point. Now, Blavatsky and Annie Besant and, uh, and, and all uh, 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 Colonel Walcott and all these people involved with the Theosophist movement believe in what's called a root race theory. Root race. How many of you ever heard that before? I've mentioned it in here in the time past, but it's been some time. Notice the word race. Root race theory. Okay? All right. Remember the chakras? How they start at the base of the spine. Serpent winds its way up across the top of the head. You get to the top. You've reached nirvana. Even as a living being, you can reach nirvana, according to these people. And then when you pass on out of the body, well, you become, you become literally one with the essence of the great knowledge of the universe. That's one way they explain it. All right. Races do the same thing. Races can either degenerate or they can, they can, they can, they can reach a higher plane. You remember what, you remember what uh, Margaret Sanger said? You remember what she said about, how many of you ever heard of eugenics? I'm preparing you. <laughs> I'm preparing you for something in here. Eugenics, all right. If you want a racehorse, how do you get a racehorse? You breed him, exactly. You breed him. You breed racehorses. You breed cattle. You breed sheep. You breed animals. You breed them. You get the best stock, continue to breed, and good breeders, you know, dogs and anything. You breed. You breed out characteristics and breed in characteristics. That's the idea. Well, this is what they're doing with human beings. They want to get back to this, 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 perfect. This, this man as he ascends upward. This is why the elite says, this is why Helen, this is why Ginsburg said, this is why she said, she said, well, I thought at the beginning the purpose of abortion was to get rid of the, those that we didn't want. Or, now, what do you mean by we don't want? Who's we and what do you mean by want? You follow me. Let's explain this. Let's define terms. What do you mean? Do you mean that you are different from them? Oh, you are? Boy. Then what the mass media pumps out to you day in and day out across your television screen and all this stuff that you get fed constantly, that's a big lie. Because the elitists, the ones who own those TV stations, they don't believe that. You got that right. Here they are. The Polarians, the Hyperboreans, the Lemurians, the Atlanteans, Atlantis, and then number five. Ascending upward are the Aryans. All right. The root race, Aryan. Guess who talked about Aryans all the time? And you got that. Where'd Hitler come from? What's he about anyway? Somebody said, well, look what he did. You're talking about just one man who was part of a much bigger picture. Yeah. Did you know that a black lady or a black woman, a black man just the other day brought suit against North Carolina. 
You know what that suit was about? Back in the 50s or the 50s or 60s, that's not too far removed, they were still practicing eugenics in the state of North Carolina. What's that? Well, that's sterilizing certain people because they didn't want their they didn't want them the eugenics. That's that's about race. It's about Have I got you thinking? We'll pick it up next week. Brother Roger Lee dismisses.